Hello, this is Onia. In this video, I'm going to be discussing the importance of learning languages, especially for what I'm trying to do in my projects and my, my research that I'm conducting. So many people do not realize how many languages there are in the world. There are something like 7,000 plus languages uh, now, perhaps some of those languages are dialects, but for the most part, they're completely separate, distinct languages that are mutually, or that they're, they're not mutually intelligible. They are of such an extent or degree where they're so different from the other languages that they're not, you can't have that one language as your, as your, native language and then understand the other people to speaking the other language. That's that's how we typically define languages is if the when the person's speaking, they're speaking so different that you can't understand what they're saying. So sometimes it can be the same language, but the two dialects are so radically different that they're considered two different languages because of how the people can't understand each other. But a good indication that they are the same language is if you are native born of a certain language and then you all of a sudden encounter another language and you can pretty easily understand it or with a little bit of effort, you can understand what they're saying without even ever learning that other language. And when that happens, you know that instead of it being a different language, it's now a different dialect of the same language. That tends to be how they define language barriers and the boundaries of different languages. Now, it's essentially impossible to learn every language in the world, but also we don't really need how many of these languages are really irrelevant to us. I prefer to focus on languages in two primary perspectives, and that is one, when the languages are uh, liter literary languages, and when the languages are widely used. If they're not necessarily literary, but they're widely used and they're important, and if they have a history of literature that is highly desirable. A large portion, a huge percentage of these languages have virtually no writing and a very small percentage of speakers. So uh, these writings we can mostly skip over. And it's when we look with those two principles, those two rules, we see that the languages of the, of Basically, the, the native languages of, you know, how you have the Native Americans, you got Native Africans, Native Australians, Native Oceanic people, all kinds of native groups, which were very primitive. They still exist, but they're very primitive in their culture, their understanding, and they don't have language, uh, written language for the most part. They don't really have a history of written language, and they don't have a lot of speakers. So actually ignore the majority of languages in Africa, the majority of languages in in oceanic area, which would be the Pacific, parts of the Atlantic. Uh, they're just irrelevant for for history and learning in general. They uh, solely in their own right of just learning a language just because. Other than that, there's no real any value in them other than understanding their that particular obscure culture. So scholars, they, they divide languages into language families, they call them. Now, this is not a perfect science. This is not a perfect classification, but it helps. And it helps to divide and classify and categorize languages and group languages that are more similar to each other 
than any other languages in the world. So scholars have identified hundreds of language families. Are the majority of the languages that are important are in, uh, and in the majority of languages in the world that exist are in, can be grouped down to something like 10 or maybe a little more or less, but a low number of language families. And two of the most, two, the two most important language families, hands down, there's no contest, the two most important ones are the Afro-Asiatic language family and the Indo-European uh, language family. Now, those two language families can also be broken down into further languages, which I will go to in a little bit. But why do I think it's so important to learn languages? Because there's so many writings out there in other languages that otherwise would be inaccessible. And I think history is important as well as science and basically all literature with the exception of, with the exception of literature that is virtually worthless, all literature has some value. Uh, the, even the little small things here and there in, in ancient literature are very insightful. In the ancient uh, about the ancient world that people lived in, it informs us a great deal of what the world was like back then. So, some languages are more important than others because it opens up so many more writings than we'd otherwise be able to expose ourselves to and read. So that's a very important thing right there. Secondly, is communication, and that is there are whole areas of the world where hundreds of millions of people speak a language and that's their only language they speak or their primary language that they speak. So if we don't learn that language, we're cutting, our, cutting off ourselves to, to that entire world. If you think about China, for example, China has what? More than a billion people, right? Something like that. But uh, that's a whole world that's completely foreign to us. If we learn Chinese, then we have access to that entire world. So learning languages can open up entire worlds to us that were never there for us before. It removes cultural barriers that don't need to be there. It's the same thing with, with uh, India, for example. You, we learn a language of India, you open up a whole new world. Billion, over a billion people in India too. So you just learn a primary Indian language and a Chinese language and you open yourself up to like 2 billion people, which is a huge advantage of interacting with the world and learning and, and communicating. There's great value in these other languages. Now, people might try to make the argument that, you know, the Tower of Babel happened, so we shouldn't really learn that many other languages. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think it's okay to learn all kinds of languages and it's okay to desire to have a one world language. That would be a great thing to return. The, the state of the thing, way things are now, so many different languages, is because of the curse that happened at the Tower of Babel. And this curse was not, you are forbidden from having the same language, but it was God's way of slowing us down because of how quickly we were, we were progressing and how rebellious we were getting. He wasn't saying we can't have a single language. He was saying, I don't want you to have a single language right now. I'm going to prevent you from doing that. And maybe when you're ready to have a single language, then you can have a single language. So I don't think there's anything wrong with trying to learn all kinds of languages and unite the world in an understanding. Because when we don't understand people, it's much easier to commit atrocities to them. When we, when you know, we'll, we'll treat, I don't agree with people treating animals like animals in the sense of when someone says, how could you do that to them? You're treating them like an animal. That is offensive to animals because we should not be abusing animals. We should not be hurting animals. We should not be treating animals as stupid or um, valueless. 
we should be treating animals on a very similar level as we treat humans. But despite that, there is that saying, you're treating them like an animal. So I use that saying even though I disagree with it because when you've got people, because it, it accurately reflects how people view animals. So that's why I use it because people unfortunately have a very bad view of animals. So when they, uh, with humans of another race, for example, or who speak a completely different language and don't speak your language, there's a temptation for those people to be much more likely to view those other humans as more like animals. They say, oh, they're just like animals because you can't, them. so it's as if they can't talk. And if they can't talk, it, it seems like they don't know anything or they have a very low intelligence like animals. But the fact is, they do have a high intelligence, they just speak a different language than you. They don't understand your language. That doesn't mean they're stupid. So learning other languages is gonna re really help people not be racist towards each other and not be hateful towards each other. But it, hel it helps prevent cultural divide and will help unite the world to a more peaceful way if we can understand them and better communicate with them. Because communication is key to avoiding atrocities. I just heard recently about some woman who there was a bank not a bank robbery. There's a, a shooter who went into a school and uh, he was going to shoot up stuff because of, I don't know, he had personal issues. The woman, there was an, an adult woman there who was working and she talked, she talked to the, to the guy and she was able to convince him not to go through with his plan. And then, you know, he was arrested, but he's going to get much less than he otherwise would have because he surrendered and he did the right thing. So just an example of, you know, if you communicate with someone who's struggling, you could avoid a mass murder. You could avoid shooting, mass shooting. You could avoid tons of atrocities just by effective communication. And my own history proves that to be true because my ex, my ex-wife, she did not communicate with me her problems. And if she had communicated with me the problems she had with me, it's very likely that I might still be with her, but she wasn't communicating. And so things piled up and piled up and she was getting uh, frustrated with me. And then she just decided not to be with me anymore. There's there's more to it than that, but I'm not gonna go into that. So basically that's my, my own life is in a, t a testament to that principle. Now with that said, I'm going to uh, go through these languages now. Now I've identified of all these languages, like 7,000 languages, I've identified roughly two, uh, about 200 of these languages, which I consider that they're the most important for us to learn, that we should be learning. Now, not, not all of us need to learn these languages, but some of us need to learn all these languages because of how important they are, I believe. So I'm going to go through the list now. Let me pull up the document file. Okay, so as I said, um, hold on, let's see, I thought I had a, a shortened list, but it looks like it's not here. Um, I'm going to, I think I have a shortened list, where is it, um, right here. So. Um, right here, here's the shortened, I guess I'm going to actually use this page instead of the, the document file. Okay, so I, I made a note on Facebook, so I'm going to be going through this note uh, for this video. So, list of 200 key languages of focus. According to the experts, there are over 7,000 languages whose existence we know of, and these languages divide into roughly 150 language families. 
I have taken a painstaking amount of time to comb through language families in an attempt to identify which I consider to be the what I consider to be the most important languages to learn and focus on. I have selected 200 languages from 24 different language families as the key languages of focus for research and communication. The language families and their language numbers listed in my list included in my list are as follows. Indo-European, I have 100 languages here. Afro-Asiatic, 32 languages. Niger, Congo, 12 languages. Sino-Tibetan, 11 languages. Austronesian, 11 languages. Turkic, 7 languages. Dravidian, 5 languages. Austro-Asiatic, 3 languages. Uralic, 3 languages. Thai Kadai, 2 languages. Sumerian, 1 language. Uh, Elamite, 1 language. Korean, 1 language. hurro urartian 1 language. Tricenian, one language, Mayan, well, you know, the rest are one language. So uh, Mayan, Kartvelian, Northeast Caucasian, Japonic, Nilo-Saharan, Mongolic, Udo-Aztecan, Quechuan, and Hmong-Mian. Now, scholars are trying to put these lang put languages into language families. It may be that some of these languages can be put into language families that are just one one language, but for now they're not they're not really in agreement on the issue of if they form language families or not. Now, with that said, I'm going to go through these languages list, go through all the lists, and I some might give a little bit of information on some of this stuff. So, so I say. Without further ado, the following are the 200 languages I've selected. So I start with Afro-Asiatic because I consider that the most important of all due to the scriptures, the Bible. So we've got here Egyptian included. Egyptian is very similar to the Semitic languages. Now what happens for Afro-Asiatic, it's divided into five, they divide it into five subgroupings. One of those subgroupings is Egyptian. Another subgrouping is Semitic languages. And Semitic languages are the ones that are important for the Bible. It's highly important for the Bible because that's what the original language of the Bible was written in, in Semitic language. Now Egyptian I have here, but that I include under Egyptian all the later versions of Egyptian, which are not mutually uh, intelligible. So that would be Coptic, for example. Coptic's included under Egyptian. Next, you got Akkadian. That's a very similar language to Hebrew in many ways, but it's also, it's kind of like a mixture between Hebrew and Sumerian, the Sumerian language. It's, it's similar to Yiddish in the sense that Hebrew and German together forms Yiddish in the same way Hebrew and Sumerian together forms Akkadian. It's a little bit of a simplification, but oversimplification, but that's ba essentially that's what Akkadian is. It was used in ancient Babylon, and it had a wide usage. Uh, but by the time of the Messiah, it was virtually extinct. Now, Eblaite is another language which is very closely related to Akkadian. Some consider it essentially a dialect of Akkadian, but others view it as a different language entirely. But so they're kind of they're both kind of similar. Now, what's different about Akkadian and Eblaite is they use what's called the Sumer. Uh, Su a cuneiform or a suniform, I forget how you pronounce that, but they use a special alphabet, which is not an alphabet, but it is a it's kind of similar to hieroglyphics in the sense that they use signs rather than letters to convey words and syllables. Now, then we have Aramaic, that's the, that's the closest language to Hebrew. Aramaic, in many ways, is kind of just a dialect of Hebrew, but it is not mutually intelligible, so they consider it a different language. But it's pretty close to a just a dialect of Hebrew because of how radically similar that it is to Hebrew. There's so many similarities of grammar, vocabulary, spelling. There's very little difference between Aramaic and Hebrew, so or relatively speaking. So you could learn Hebrew and it would be pretty easy to learn Aramaic after that. You don't have to do much effort to learn it. Now then we got Ugaritic, which is very close to Hebrew. It's the closest to Hebrew, I think, if I remember correctly, I think I think it's the closest to Hebrew other than Aramaic. And so Ugaritic is, it has two versions where there's a 22 letter 
and then there's I think there's a 30 it's either 28 or 30 I think it's 30 it's basically it uses some of the suniform as signs but it only limits it to it limits it to 22 or 30 uh, signs and these signs uh, so having 22 letter so this is basically uh, a alphabetic uh, language so that makes it very similar to Hebrew in that sense and this is important this this was discovered in the 20th century 20th century I believe and it's very important for understanding Hebrew because of how close it is there's so many cognates now cognate is a both languages have that same vocabulary word but they didn't borrow it from each other it's derived from that common ancestor so that's an example of for example eight and oct uh, for for Latin you know you have the word octagon that comes from the Latin octa and oct is the same exact word as eight in English, but they're cognates. They come from two different. Uh, they're not. They they would they didn't borrow from each other. So that's what a cognate is. So Ugaritic has a lot of cognates. It has very similar grammar rules as Hebrew. Now I have here listed Canaanite. I don't necessarily like that term, but I'm using that because that's the term that they use. So Canaanite incorporates Hebrew. It also incorporates Phoenician. All the dialects of Hebrew are incorporated under Can Canaanite. Next, you've got Arabic, which is similar to Aramaic in many ways. Arabic didn't really exist before, I mean, in a written form. We don't have any, we don't have much testimony to Arabic in a literary form before the, the time of the Quran. There was a little bit here and there, like inscriptions, but for the most part, Arabic is a late language that that developed from older Arabic language that is fragmentary. Now, some of these are older Arabic languages. Uh, so we've got Sabian, Katabanian, Hadramitic, Manian. Uh, I forget where it ends for the for the Arabic languages, but you saw some of these are Arabic languages. Now, let me start going into Ethiopian oh, Ethiopian languages. So you've got Ge'ez. Now that's the most important Ethiopian language. That was the key one used for Ethiopian Orthodox Church and in Ethiopia in general for much of the Middle Ages. However, that became eventually extinct. So now people who speak that only speak that for church uh, purposes or for learning, uh, for studying writings. They don't you really use that to, to communicate anymore in common communications. But now you have these uh, Ethiopian languages, which are which have relatively small population groups who learn them. But there's Tigrinia, Tigre, Dahalic. And these these uh, Ethiopian languages. Well, let me say a few more: Amharic, Argaba, Harari. Silta, Zwe, Gafa, Sado, Muhur, Mesken, Sabat, Bet. The, those, if that looks similar, that is because it is similar. It's those same. It's in Hebrew. This is those words are in Hebrew, and these are cognates. Once again, they're cognates. Same vocabulary word with, from with the Hebrew. Okay, so these languages are Ethiopian, but they're they're spoken in varying degrees of numbers. Uh, a lot of them are obscure and only spoken by a few, but uh, relatively few. But Amharic is the most important of these because of how many people speak it and because of its important literary history. So next to Gaze, Amharic is the one that is very important. I put all these on the list though because I in order to reconstruct the original Hebrew as best as possible, we want to have a good understanding of all the Semitic languages. So I pretty much tried to put all the Semitic languages that we have, at least enough transcriptions to understand the language. I've put them all on this list because of how important they are for reconstructing the original Hebrew and understanding Hebrew and knowing cognates, knowing so restoring some lost vocabulary of Hebrew. Because the fact is, 
There used to be a lot more words in the Hebrew language. We lost a lot of these words when we lost the writings and then we stopped speaking Hebrew for the most part. People stopped speaking Hebrew, so the words were forgotten. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, more words were discovered that were formerly not known to exist. So we can use new discoveries of manuscripts to discover new words of Hebrew, but also other languages can help us reconstruct some of the lost words of Hebrew. So that's why it's so important to learn these other languages. Now we move on and, and uh, these are African languages in the, and they're part of the Afro-Asiatic family, but they're not part of Semitic languages, not part of Egyptian languages. They are in uh, their own classifications. I have them on this list because of how many people speak them and not for really literary purposes, except one, I think one of them might have a literary history, but for the most part, uh, it's because of how many people speak them rather than uh, writing purposes. Um, but these are the most important African languages uh, to learn. Then I, I have here language isolates. Now, what a language isolate means is scholars consider these language isolates as having no languages similar to them that we currently know about, that they, they can't be grouped into a language family. So Sumerian, we have that there because we they don't feel like there's any other language which can be, can be grouped with Sumerian. Same thing with Elamite and Korean. Now Sumerian is one of the most important languages because of how ancient it is, more ancient than pretty much every language that we know of in terms of uh, manuscript preservation or writings, preserving of writings. Sumerian is very important for that. A lot of pagan stuff, but it would be very valuable for us to learn Sumerian and learn these writings, uh, learn about these writings and read them, study from them, because it would really help us understand our history the world history and where we all came from. Uh, and these again are written in, they are written in a suniform. Now Korean has their own unique uh, alphabet or writing system. I forget what it looks like. Um, but Korean does not have any similarities with other languages apparently that they, that they can confidently group it with. Now, Korean is important because of how many people speak it. So we have that there. Now, for the Hurro-Eurasian language, there were a couple of other languages in, the, in this language family, but I included Hurrian here only because that's the main one that has actual documentary evidence. The others are pretty much so obscure and we don't really have anything preserving it much at all. That you, we can't really learn those other languages much at all. So. But I put Hurrian here because we can learn it a little bit, and it's a very ancient language, which makes it very, uh, similar of importance as Sumerian and Elamite because of how ancient it is. And I believe it also is written in a suniform characters. And the Egyptian language is written in hieroglyphics, as we know, in the original. And later on in Coptic, Coptic took the alphabet from the Greek language, as well as a few letters from the um, from the later dialect of Egyptian, which I forget the name at the moment, having a momentary lapse of memory on that. Um, demotic, that's what it is, demotic. Not demonic, but demotic was a late form of Egyptian, which Coptic is derived from. And so Coptic takes its alphabet from Greek as well as some of the demotic letters. Now, we go to the Euro Indo-European language, which is, which is the most important. Well, not excuse me, not most important. The second most important in terms of, you know, the first most important was Afro-Asiatic because of the Bible. The second most important is Indo-European because of the Bible, the, the scriptures. But I include a bunch of languages there that aren't so important for the Bible but are important for a greater understanding of Indo-European languages. Now, I think it's important to learn uh, as many languages as we can in a certain language family, if at all possible, as long as there's not like thousands of languages in that language family, or many, many hundreds, you know, if there is a small number, a smaller number of languages in a language family, we can, we can learn all those languages or most of them. And if we did that, we'd have a huge advantage over the people of understanding these languages and piecing, the, 
pieces together. So we've got Albanian. That's in a language grouping of its own. It's separate. Like Indo-European is broken down into 10 different groups and Albanian is its own group. It doesn't, it, it's very different from all the other languages, but it's close enough to still be grouped as part of the Indo-European family. Then you've got Hittite. I, I, and I also wanted to have at least one representative from each grouping. So since Albanian is the only grouping of its own unique group uh, for, within the Indo-European language families, that makes it important to learn. And there are some writings in it, in that language. So I put that on the list. Then you got Hittite and Luwian. They're the oldest preserved languages of Indo-European in, in fragmentary writings. So we've got, these are very ancient. And I, I think these were also written in Suniform. It just shows the, you know, the original form of Indo-European is much more archaic. It's much more complex than these langu later languages might indicate. But so Hittite and Luwian are very key to reconstructing the original language of Indo-European. Because all these languages, they derive from a single ancestor, not Hebrew. They derive from a single ancestor of Indo-European. And then when the people branched off, they start developing dialects depending where they were. And a lot of these languages are developed from Latin, which will be explained a little bit. Uh, now you've got Armenian. Some people, uh, some scholars connect Armenian to some Iranian languages, which is later on in the list. But Armenian is important for the Bible because there are many manuscripts of the Bible as well as extra biblical books, uh, which I consider scripture, you know, apocrypha stuff in Armenian. So that's important. And there are, important writings of history in Armenian language. So that is valuable to learn. Now we go into uh, Latin, uh, no, I'm sorry, not Latin languages. Um, these are, we go into Russian languages and you got, so you got Lithuanian, Latvian, Czech, Slovak, Polish, Upper Sorbian, Lower Sorbian, Serbo-Croatian, Slovene. I put these languages here because they all are similar to each other, and they learning one helps you learn the other, and they're a good group to learn to better understand them. Then you've got a uh, Church Slavonic, and then under that umbrella, I'm including the Old Church Slavonic. And some manuscripts of the Bible and Apocrypha are in that language, although. Uh, much less so than the other languages. Uh, and, uh, in general, the Church of Lonic is not as important as many of these other languages, but uh, but I have it there. Now you've got Bulgarian, Macedonian, Belarusian, Russian, and Ukrainian. These are all similar, connected to each other. Important to learn for having a greater understanding of the Russian culture and language. And Russia is important, especially in our day, of how influential it is in in the world we live in. So we should try to be able to communicate with these people and understand their history, their rich history, their rich culture. Now also, for my own life, I have, I have um, ethnicity or descent from certain groups like Irish, Swedish, and, and French, and things like that. So. Those languages are even more important for me personally to learn from, from my heritage, but those languages are important in their own right too. But so I have Irish, Scottish, Gaelic, Breton, Cornish, Welsh. These are languages which help us better understand European history and where many of us derive our ancestry from these languages can help us have a better appreciation for that stuff. Now, German, you hear people say German or Germany, and you think of only one German, but there are tons of different Germans. But they can roughly be divided into three different groupings, Upper German, Standard German, and Central German. Now, what's interesting is these German languages, they're called Germanic languages, just like there's Semitic languages, there's also Germanic languages. 
In other words, Semitic languages are part of the Afroasiatic language family. In the same way, Germanic languages are part of the Indo-European languages. Germanic languages are closer to each other than any other language grouping. Same thing with Semitic languages being closer to each other than any other language grouping. So what that means essentially is all the Germanic languages originally derived from an original Germanic language. So German and English derived from the same language originally. Just it's far removed over time. Uh, so we do have low German as well down here. Limburgish, Dutch, Afrikaans. Afrikaans is, is very similar to Dutch. Some might even consider it a dialect. Um, so these are important languages. It's not necessary to learn all the different uh, dialects of German because there's so many different dialects of English that we don't need to learn. But for German, these are not just different dialects. These these three and this, they're not different dialects, they're different languages. Very different languages. And then each of these very different languages has their dialects. So Upper German with its dialects, Standard German with its dialects, Central German with its dialects, and Low German with its dialects. Now you got Frisian in that. Other than Scots, it's the closest language to English. It's very similar, more than any other language to English. So it makes Frisian interesting to learn because of how close it is. It's like, wow, that's so similar. That's pretty cool. We just be very insightful to, to for that how for the proximity of English. Now Scots, I think this is more like a different dialect of English because I haven't learned Scots, but I can look at I can't understand it when someone speaks it much at all. A little bit here and there if I'm very slow and re listen to it over and over again. I might be able to understand. For the most part, I can't understand when hearing it, but you can understand it when you read it. You read a Scots t document, you can understand it roughly pretty well, but it's still very difficult to understand. And a lot of English speakers probably could not understand it, but I, I have somewhat of an education in, in languages. So I didn't even need to learn Scots to be able to roughly understand the basic meaning of a lot of Scots sentences. Of course, some sentences are more foreign to English than others, but so anyways, that, that's a very interesting for its connection to English and better understanding our English. Uh, now under English, I also include Old English and Middle English and all the different dialects of English. They're all grouped together in that single category. Then there's Icelandic, Faoris, Norn, Norwegian, Danish, Swedish. Now, apparently, from what I read, Swedish and Norwegian are very similar and can be mutually understood between each other, at least to a degree. So, in some ways, they're not so much distinct languages, but in other ways, they are. So, we have them as different languages here. Darkalian, Dalkarlian, similar to Swedish, if I remember correctly. So, all these kind of, they go back to an original language. And then this original language also links up with this original language. Go back and to a common ancestor. Um, there's Gutnish, which is an extinct language. Gothic, very fragmentary language, which we don't have a full understanding of, but some fragments of it for the Bible have been preserved. It's very important for uh, the New Testament uh, fragments. That, that are preserved in the Gothic language. That's what, how important Gothic is. And we're still trying to better understand the language because of how little is preserved in that language. Now, Greek is one of the most important languages in the world because of how, many, how much literature was written in it and how significant Greek uh, literary work and history has influenced this world. And because of the Bible and the extra books being predominantly written in Greek, uh, translated from the original Hebrew, uh, being written in Greek is very important for that reason. Then you've got the Iranian and Indian languages, which we're going to. So you've got the Avestan, which is the language of the ancient religion of the Iranians. 
little is otherwise. Ossetian, Pashto, Sogdian, Saka, Mazandarani, Gilaki, Persian. I like Persian a lot in the sense of that one seems more attractive than a lot of these other languages. Um, Gorani, Kurdish, Baloki, Parthian. So these are all ancient Iranian languages or, you know, they're, they're Iranian languages which have some value to learn, I believe. I don't give as much commentary on this part because I don't remember some of what these languages even are. Uh, but I put them on this list because of my, my belief that they are valuable to an extent to learn for communication as well as written history or understanding the Indo-European language, language family better. Now, next you got Sanskrit, which is perhaps the most important Indian language of all because of how ancient it is and how many, how many writings are preserved in it. It preserves their ancient scriptures in Sanskrit, so that's highly significant for that. Pali as well uh, is an ancient language which preserves uh, the ancient scriptures of the Buddhist Buddhism, so that's important for that history. There's other writings too in Pali. There's Kashmiri, Punjabi, Sindhi, Rajasthani, Gujarati, Marathi, Konkani, uh, Maldivian, Sinhalese, Odia, Maithili, Awadhi, Bhojpuri, Magahi, Bengali, Assamese, Bishnupriya. Uh, so a lot of these languages are seem obscure. I don't even remember a lot of what these languages even are, but they're here for their importance for his, uh, history, written history, as well as communication and better understanding the European, Indo-European language family. Um, now, we've got Hindustani, which un included under that is Hindi, as well as another language, which is considered essentially the same language. So they group it together as Hindustani. Romani, Haryanvi, Nepali. So all these are just very related languages, important languages to reconstruct the Ar Iranian Indian language. Uh, uh, the, just like Germanic languages, there was originally one language of Germanic, which is the ancestor to, ancestor to all Germanic languages. The same thing we've got with all the Iranian languages and all the Indian languages. Now we go to a very another language which is very significant and very important is Latin. That was you can make a strong argument and you could probably be right that Latin is much more influential than Greek, even though the most ancient of or not the most ancient, but Greek has an older history uh, than Latin does in terms of written history, but. The Latin is so well um, testified uh, and so influential because of so many languages deriving from it. Now, just a little bit of information. Uh, the Greek language took their alphabet from the Hebrew language, the, the Phoenician language. So Greek took their alphabet from that. Then they, have, they added some other letters from some other source. We don't know what source they added these are the letters from. So then the Greek alphabet was taken by the Latin alphabet. And many other languages have since taken their alphabets from the Greek or Latin language. The uh, Armenian language took it from the Greek. And just a lot of languages take their alphabets from Latin. So Latin was, they took their alphabet from Greek English originally didn't have our alphabet. It had uh, what's called runes. It had runes, just like German and other other ancient Germanic languages. They had runes instead of letters, uh, instead of the alphabetic letters. They had runes, which are basically letters, but they're written in with the special shape that the runes have. But eventually, the runes were considered pagan. And so they felt when, when they were converted to Christianity, they decided to take Latin uh, and replace it, their words 
write their words in Latin letters instead of instead of runic letters because uh, they felt that was better to their Christ new Christian faith. So because they were Christianized, they were evangelized and they converted to Christianity. So they wanted to remove all uh, semblance of paganism. So they removed their former letters they used and replaced them with the Latin letters. So that's how essentially uh, English language is derived from the Hebrew alphabet because they took the Latin alphabet, which was derived from the Greek alphabet, which was derived from the Hebrew alphabet. Now, Latin, there are some other dialects uh, with Latin which uh, are very fragmentary, and so I didn't really include them on the list much at all. But Latin is a pre predominant one in the Italic language uh, family and the primary representative. And Latin breaks down to all its different dialects, what's called the Romance languages. Now, Latin was spoken in the official Latin. There was also something called a vulgar Latin, which was basically to be a little bit uh, rough in the um, crude, in a sense, not crude, but I don't know the right way to put it. But basically, I don't mean this, in, but I'm going to say it. It's vulgar Latin was like the Latin of stupid people. Not stupid people, but uneducated, unlearned. And of course, it's an exaggeration. It's a generalization. But generally speaking, vulgar Latin was the Latin that common people spoke for ease of communication without having all those archaic, all the archaic stuff. It was simple. It was a simplified version of Latin to make it easier to communicate. Over time, that simplified version started getting even more simplified in the different regions they were and getting more affected by neighboring languages that influenced it through as well as copying some of the sounds from other language cultures. So from the vulgar Latin, we end up having what's called the Romance languages. And I think they're so important for understanding how Latin has developed that I've put almost all the Romance languages on this list of importance to learn. So I've got Sardinian, which if I remember correctly, Sardinian is the closest Romance language to Latin uh, in similarity. And then you have Romanian, Abromanian, Italian, Venetian, Sicilian. Now the, these are sim similar to Italian, but apparently they're different enough from Italian that they deserve to be separately classed uh, as different languages. Now, then you got standard French and non-standard French. I have it grouped into two languages because of their important distinctions that make them different languages. Uh, Occitan, Catalan. Now there's like two different languages or several languages in this group, which they're considered more like dialects because of how similar they are. You got Portuguese, Spanish. Spanish is very important, because, especially in America, because of how many people speak it. And in the whole world, a huge number of people speak Spanish. I think it's third to Chinese and English. So that's important. And Asturianese, once again, a similar languages grouped as a single language here. Franco-Provencial, multiple languages grouped as one language because of basically being like dialects. You got Romance, Ladin. Which, which if you see, well, Latin, that sounds like Latin. And that's not a coincidence. That's because they wanted to preserve that in the name. They call it Latin for some reason. I don't remember why, but it is because it is the same word as Latin. They just call it Latin, Ladin. Uh, and then you got Frulian, Lombard, Piedmontese, and then you've got Tukharian. That's its own language grouping. That's one of the oldest Indo-European and there's very little preserved in that, but enough preserved that we probably learn a little bit about it, and it would be valuable to learn it to have a greater understanding of the original Indo-European language. Now we've got Sino-Tibetan, which is Chinese. I put 11 languages here because of how many people speak these languages and because it's just important for understanding these Chinese people. A huge portion of the world here is cut off from us because we don't know Chinese. Now it's an oversimplification just to say, did you learn Chinese? It's kind of ignorance because 
there's so many languages which are a form of Chinese, but which are very different from the Chinese we we think of. The Chinese we think of as the standard is Mandarin Chinese. But in addition to Mandarin Chinese, you've got Wu Chinese, Gan Chinese, Zhang Chinese, Min Chinese, Hakka Chinese, Yue Chinese. All of these Chinese languages have millions of speakers, many millions of speakers, as well as all being important. And they all derive from, I, if I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure they all derive from the same ancient Chinese, old Chinese. So it's important for reconstructing, in some sense, reconstructing the ancient Chinese to learn these other Chinese languages. Then you've got Burmese, Meite and Nepal Bhasa, but then you, uh, classical Tibetan. And Tibetan is important for, once again, for Buddhism, for some of their scriptures from their holy sacred writings are written in this Tibetan. So that makes it important. Other, other important writings of in, India, or not India, you know, um, Asia are written in Tibetan. So this makes, this makes, uh, these languages very important for understanding their history because their their history is so different than our history. So we really need to learn these languages so we can truly appreciate and better understand their world and their past. Etruscan is important because of some similarities with Latin, um, and it has a lot of fragments. It's one of the best preserved fragmentary languages. So it's very extinct. It went extinct a long time ago, but there's a lot of fragments there which can we can understand that language very well and um and, and because of how ancient it is, it has importance for history. And Dravidian, these are the only Dravidian languages which have a written a written uh, history. Four of these languages have a roughly ancient written history in, you know, going back at least, you know, about a thousand years or more, especially Tamil. Tamil is one of the more important of these because this also has some scriptures written in it. But you've also got, you know, you got these other languages here, which are, they're all important for that history purposes. Classical Mayan. There are other Mayan languages, uh, if I remember correctly, but classical Mayan is the most important one. And I have that there on this list because uh, there might not actually be more other Mayan languages. I don't remember, but uh, classical Mayan is, I have it here because of, without classical Mayan, we have such a huge hole in knowledge of the Native American world. Like this language helps us understand them. And it's funny because when I was in school, I didn't realize that they had written languages in the Americas. I thought they were just like the Africa uh, primitive people who didn't have any languages. But no, they actually did have languages. So that, I found that pretty cool. Uh, I mean, I knew they had languages. I mean, written languages. So these people developed written language, um, which suggests a common ancestry from the rest of humans, not as far back as people might think. You know, um, people theorize that the people in Americas came from Asia because of how close Alaska is to Russia. That is a very great possibility and probably makes the most sense of where they came from. Some people might have come from overseas through boats, but for the most part, they probably went through the easiest way to travel, and that was through that small distance of water between those two continents. <clears throat> so, Mayan is key for understanding the ancient Amer Americas. Without it, we'd, we'd have a huge lack of understanding. So to better understand our own America, if we live in America, to better understand, you know, the American history, this is key. And, for, you know, if you don't live in America, but you want to better understand America and their, and their past, this is key. And Austronesian languages. Now, that's one of the biggest language families as well. It has a lot of languages in it. But I only include 11 because these languages are the only ones which have a written history or a sizable enough language grouping which makes them valuable to learn. So I've got on this Cham, Malay, Javanese, 
which is not Japanese, it's different. It's not a mistyping, not misspelling, but it's a different language entirely. Balinese, Sundanese, and, and Japanese is un completely unrelated to Japanese. Uh, you got Tagalog, Madurese, Malagasy, Cebuano, Hiligaynon, and Ilocano. So these are the Austronesian language families. And you got Georgian. There's some manuscripts of the Bible and extra books in Georgian. They also have some historical writings. And so that makes it uh, valuable to learn. Kartvelian, Austroasiatic. I picked three of the languages which have enough speakers or written history to be relevant. Northeast Caucasian only got the one, Udi. And Japonic, they only have two languages listed there. Uh, but the second language seems very similar to Japanese, so it may be essentially just a dialect of Japanese. But they had it on the list I was consulting, they had it grouped as two different languages. So Japanese, uh, I think it's important to learn for, the, for understanding their culture and history. And it opens up a new world to us as well in that sense. Nalo Saharan, there's so many languages, a huge language family. The only one that seems to be of interest is Nubian. All the other ones seem to be really obscure, very few speakers, and not so not so important really for us to learn. So I, and also there's a little bit of fragments about from the Bible in the Nilo Saharan. So I think that's important for that reason. I probably though didn't put as much research into Nilo Saharan as others, but I did skim somewhat a little bit of it uh, and decide to go with Nubian as included, but none of the other ones I included. Now Turkic I've got seven languages here. There's a little bit of manuscript stuff for some of the extra biblical books, you know, but for the most part, the, they're more important just for their own historical writings. Uralic, you've got Hungarian, Finnish, and Estonian, and those are important more for how many people speak them than for their writings. So they, they do have some written history, but only, only back to about 500 years or something like that. Uh, not more than a thousand years. Mongolian, I have here for the Mongol Mongolic language grouping. Uh, tai Kadai, there's two languages there, so Tai and Zhuang. Classical Nahuatl, that's a another American language, a Native American language, which is important for understanding the history of America. That's Uto Aztecan, Aztec. That's where you know that word is related. Niger Congo. Oh yeah, these are other African languages. Now, none of these languages are really important at all for written, but I have them here because a large number speak these languages. So they definitely need to be on this list if we wanna have good communication with that, our African brothers, our African families. Um, Quechuan, which is also another Native American language if I remember correctly. And you got Hmong Mian. And then there's also a the constructed language Esperanto, which I do think is important for us to learn because of how many people speak it, and it's a it's considered a universal language for people to learn and communicate with. So that's important, I think. And out of these 200 languages, I attribute priority to the following 25 languages. So obviously, it's, you can't, it's going to be very difficult to even learn anything close to 200 languages, let alone learning all 200 languages. So you have to pick and choose which are the most important to focus, focus on, and then the other languages we can deal with uh, at a, when we're able to have more time to learn some of those languages. So I decided to, to condense the 200 languages to just 25 languages, which are the most important, and which are absolutely need to be learned for their importance for history, as well as the scriptures. And that is Canaanite, is the most important, which is Hebrew, uh, Aramaic, Ge'ez, Arabic, Akkadian, Ugaritic, Eblaid, Sabian, Amharic. So these are the Semitic languages. The nine nine Semitic languages are the most important to learn. And you've got Greek next, hands down. Greek, I consider Greek more important than Latin because of, for the biblical value. Uh, otherwise, I might consider Latin more important just because of how much more influential Latin was in all the other areas of literature and history. But Greeks, I have first because of 
is importance. It's much greater importance in biblical and extra biblical history than Latin. Egyptian comes next, once again, also in terms of its importance for the Bible, but also its ancient literature, very important. Gothic for the Bible, its importance in the Bible. Armenian as well for its importance in the Bible, Church Slavonic. Italian and French important for learning for some portions of the Bible for my perspective, as well as standard German, because a lot of a lot of scholarly work is written in German language and French. And more rarely, but still often enough to be important, is Italian scholarly writings in Italian. So we learn these languages because of their importance for the biblical field of study. Nubian is a little bit important for biblical stuff, so I, I probably though should put Georgian before Nubian, but you know, then we got Sumerian because of how ancient and insignificant it is. Elamite, same thing. These are two ancient languages which are very influential because of, they're like older than pretty much every other language. So we, those are key languages we want to have on this list. English because of how influential and worldwide this language is. Ma same thing for Mandarin Chinese and same thing for Spanish. The three greatest languages in the world, most spoken, most influential in our current society today. Uh, we really need to learn those languages so we can better interact with people. And for my version, my Bible project, I mean, there needs to be something for these other languages. So I do intend at some point to translate at least a translation of the scriptures that I do into Chinese and Spanish. That would be ideal. It might not happen, but or I might have someone else do it for me if I can't learn these languages. I think I can learn Spanish not too hard, but Chinese is going to be difficult. Now, uh, I really would value to use a bunch of writings in my Bible project just to have a greater understanding of these languages. We'll see what will happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to invest a lot of time into researching and learning languages. But I'm not going to wait to learn the 200 languages before I start my Bible project. <laughs> the languages I'm going to learn before I start my Bible project, I need to master Hebrew and Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. I need to master those. I will also um, want to master Gaiz. Under Aramaic, I include Syriac as well. Um, and I will want to learn Coptic. So some of these languages I will want to learn before I start, or before I go full fledged into this Bible project. Well, other languages I don't really need so much for this Bible project. So, but hopefully, uh, and then also for my studies of history, historical writings, um, I'll focus on these 25 languages for the historical writings. Anyways, that's kind of an overview of the 200 languages I think are most important, as well as the 25 of those, which are the truly the most important of those. So hope this has valued you and that you will benefit from it. Help this process of learning these languages and join me on this journey of restoring the truth and learning about the ancient world that has been lost to us so that we can better understand the world we live in and correct the errors and falsehoods that are so prominent and still being dogmatically spread by the experts and scholars of our society. We want to change that. We want to expose the truth of history, but how can we expose the truth of history unless we learn the actual resources ourselves and see what the actual resources say and not what the scholars say. So we don't want the history books. We want the real deal. We want the history, writings, the actual primary sources. And that's what the, all these learning these languages is about, is to learn these sources and communicate with people separated by culture and language so we can have a greater understanding of the world and we can love each other better. Because that, that's what it's all about. It's about loving each other and respecting each other and helping each other grow and be better people. So anyways, that's this is the video. Hope you enjoyed this and... I will try to do more teachings coming soon. God bless you all, and I hope you have a wonderful week.